was playing, Lane. I didn't think it very polite to listen, sir. I'm sorry for that for your sake. I don't play accurately. Anyone can play accurately, but I play with wonderful expression. When it comes to the piano, sentiment is my forte. I keep science for life. Yes, sir. Speaking of the science of life, have you got the cucumber sandwiches cut for Lady Brackman? Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Lane, I noticed from my books that on Thursday night, when Lord Shawman and Mr. Worthing were dining with me, eight bottles of champagne are entered as having been consumed. Yes, sir. Eight bottles and a pint. Why is it that at a bachelor's establishment, the servants invariably drink the champagne? I ask merely for information. I attribute it to the superior quality of the wine, sir. I have often observed that in married households, the champagne is rarely of a first-rate brand. Good heavens, is marriage as demoralizing as that? I do believe it is a very pleasant state, sir. I have very little experience of it myself to the present. I've only been married once, and that was a consequence of a misunderstanding between myself and a younger person. I don't know that I'm quite interested in your family life, Lane. No, sir, it's not a very interesting subject. I don't think of it myself. Quite natural, I'm sure. That'll be all, Lane. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lane's views on marriage seem somewhat lax. Really, if the lower order don't set a good example for the rest of us, what on earth is the use of them? They seem to me as a class to have no sense of moral responsibility. Mr. Ernest Worthy. Oh, <laughs> Ernest, dear boy, what brings you into town? Oh, pleasure, pleasure. What else would bring anyone anywhere? Eating as usual, I see, LG. I do believe it is customary in good society to take some slight refreshment at five o'clock. Where have you been since last Thursday? Oh, the country. What on earth do you do there? Uh, when one is in town, one amuses oneself. When one is in the country, one amuses other people. It's excessively boring. And uh, who are the people you amuse? Uh, uh, neighbors. Neighbors. Got nice neighbors in your part of Shawshank? <coughs> Perfectly horrid. Never speak to one of them. How immensely you must amuse them. By the way, Shropshire is your county, is it not? Uh, Shropshire, uh, yes, 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 of course. Of course. Uh, why all these cups? Why cucumber sandwiches? Why such reckless extravagance in one so young? Who's coming to tea? Oh, Millie Aunt Augusta. And Gwendolyn. Oh, how perfectly delightful. Yes, that's all very well, but uh, I don't think Aunt Augusta will much approve of your being here. May I ask why? Well, the way you flirt with Gwendolyn is perfectly disgraceful. It's almost as bad as the way Gwendolyn flirts with you. I am in love with Gwendolyn. I've come up to town expressly to propose to her. I thought you said you came up for pleasure. That sounds like business. Oh, how utterly unromantic you are. I don't see anything romantic in proposing. It's perfectly romantic to be in love, but there's nothing romantic about a definite proposal. The very essence of romance is uncertainty. If I ever get married, I'll certainly try to forget the fact. <laughs> I have no doubt about that, dear Algy. The divorce court was specially invented for people whose memories are so uh, curiously constituted. Oh, there's no use speculating on that subject, dear boy. Divorces were made in heaven. Oh, please don't touch the cucumber sandwiches. They're, they're reserved specially for Aunt Augusta. But you've been eating them all the time. Well, it's quite a different matter. She's my aunt. Here, have some bread and butter. The bread and butter is for Gwendolyn. The Gwendolyn is devoted to bread and butter. Oh, yes, and uh, mm, very good bread and butter it is, too. Well, you need not eat it as if you were going to eat it all. You act as if you're married already. You're not married already, and I don't think you ever will be. Why on earth do you say that? Well, first of all, women don't marry the men they flirt with. Women don't think it right. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. It's a great truth. It accounts for the extraordinary number of bachelors one sees all over the place. In the second place, I don't give my consent. Your consent? Dear boy, Gwendolyn is my first cousin. And if I'm going to allow you to marry her, we have to clear up the whole issue of uh, Cecily. Cecily? What do you mean, Algy? What do you mean by Cecily? I don't know anyone by the name of Cecily. Bring me that cigarette case that uh, Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room last time he dined here. Yes, sir. Do you mean to tell me you've had my cigarette case all this time? I wish to goodness you had let me know. I've been writing frantic letters to Scotland Yard about it. I was very nearly offering a large reward. I wish you would offer one. I'm more than usually hard up. There's no use in offering a large reward now. The thing is found. 
I find that rather mean of you, Annas, I must say. However, now that I look at the inscription on the inside, I realize that it makes no matter that this thing isn't yours at all. Of course it's mine. You've seen me with it a hundred times. And you have no right whatsoever to read what's written inside. It's a very ungentlemanly thing to do to read a private cigarette case. Oh, it's perfectly absurd to have a hard and fast rule about what one should read and what one shouldn't read. More than half of modern cultures depending on what one shouldn't read. I am quite aware of the fact, and I don't propose to speak on modern culture. It's not the type of thing one talks about in private. Now just give me back my cigarette yes, case. Yes, but this isn't your cigarette case. You see, this cigarette case is a gift by someone of the name of Cecily, and you said you didn't know anyone of that name. Well, if you want to know, Cecily is uh, my aunt. Your aunt? Yes! Charming old lady she is too! Lives in Tunbridge Wells! Just give it back to me, Algie! But that doesn't account for the fact that she calls herself Little Cecily. From Little Cecily with her, her fondest love. Oh, what on earth is there in that? Some aunts are tall! Some aunts are not tall! Surely that is a matter that the aunt may be allowed to decide for themselves! You think every aunt should be exactly like your aunt? That is absurd! Now, for heaven's sake, give me back my cigarette case! But why does she call you her uncle? I, there's no objection, I admit, to an aunt being a, a small aunt, but why an aunt, no matter what her size may be, would call her own nephew her uncle, I, I can't quite make out. Uh, besides, your, your name isn't Jack at all, it's, it's Ernest. It isn't Ernest, it's, it's Jack. You've always gone by the name of Ernest. I I've introduced you as Ernest. You, you look as if your name is Ernest. You're the most earnest looking person I've ever seen in my life. Matter of fact, it's on one of your cards. Here's one. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany. I'll keep this as proof if you ever try to deny that your name is Ernest to me or to Gwendolyn or to anyone else. Well, I go by Ernest in town and Jack in the country. And the cigarette case was given to me in the country. That doesn't account for why your small Aunt Cecily, who lives at Tunbridge Wells, calls you her uncle. Come on, old boy, you better have the thing out at once. You know, Algie, you shouldn't talk as if you're a dentist when you're not a dentist. It's very vulgar for someone to talk as if a dentist when they're not. It produces a false impression. That's exactly what dentists always do. Come on, old boy, you better have the thing out at once. Well, produce my cigarette case first. Fine. Now, produce your explanation and pray make it improbable. <laughs> my dear Algy, I'm afraid my explanation is not improbable at all. In fact, it's quite ordinary. <laughs> Mr. Thomas Cardew, who adopted me when I was a young boy, made me in his will guardian to his granddaughter, Miss Cecily Cardew. Cecily, who refers to me as uncle for motives of respect you cannot possibly appreciate, lives in my place in the country under the charge of her Admiral Governess, Miss Prism. Where is that place in the country, by the way? That is nothing to you, dear boy! You're not going to be invited! I can tell you quite candidly, it's not in Shropshire. <laughs> I suspected that, dear boy. I've been buried all over Shropshire on two separate occasions. Now, go on, tell me. Why are you Ernest in town and Jack in the country? <laughs> Algy, I don't know that you'll be able to understand my real motives. You're hardly serious enough. When one is placed into the position of guardian, one has to adopt a high moral tone on all subjects. It's one's duty to do so. And as a high moral tone can hardly, hardly be said to conduce much for one's health or one's happiness, in order to get up to town as often as I like, I pretended to have a younger brother by the name of Ernest who lived in the Albany and getting the most terrible scrapes. That, my dear Algie, is the whole truth, pure and simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. What you really are is a Bunburyist. I was quite right in saying you're a Bunburyist. You're one of the most advanced Bunburyists I know. What on earth do you mean? You have invented a very useful younger brother for yourself by the name of Ernest so that you may go into town whenever you like. I've invented an invaluable permanent invalid by the name of Bunbury so that I may go into the country whenever I choose. Bunbury's perfectly invaluable. If it weren't for Bunbury's extraordinarily <coughs> <coughs> bad health, for instance, I wouldn't be able to dine with you at Willis's tonight, for I've been really engaged to Aunt Augusta for more than a week. I haven't asked you to dine with me anywhere tonight. 
I know you're perfectly careless about sending out invitations. It's, it's very foolish of you. Nothing annoys people so much as not receiving an invitation. You had much better dine with your Aunt Augusta. I haven't the smallest intention of doing anything of the kind. In the first place, I dine there on Monday, and once a week is quite enough to dine with one's own relations. In the second place, I know exactly whom she'll sit me next to, Miss Mary Farquhar, who always flirts with her husband from across the dinner table. It's, it's not pleasant. In fact, it's, it's not even decent. And that sort of thing is enormously on the increase. The amount of women in London who flirt with their husbands is, is perfectly scandalous. It, it, it looks so bad. It's simply washing one's clean linen in public. <laughs> Besides, now that I know you to be a bunburyist, I naturally want to talk to you about bunburying. I want to teach you the rules. I'm not a bunburyist at all. If Gwendolyn accepts me, I'm going to kill my brother. In fact, I uh, think I'll kill him in any case. Cecily's a little too much interested in him, and it's rather a bore. So, I'm going to get rid of Ernest, and I suggest you do the same with your Mr... Mr... Um, the, your Emily friend with that absurd name. Nothing will ever induce me to part with Bunbury. And if you ever get married, which seems to me extremely problematic, you'll be very happy to know Bunbury. A man who marries without knowing Bunbury has a very tedious time of it. That is nonsense. If I marry a charming girl like Gwendolyn, who is the only girl I ever saw in my life, I would marry. I certainly won't want to know Bunbury. Then your wife will. What you don't seem to understand is that in married life, three is company and two is none. For heaven's sakes, don't try to be cynical. It's perfectly easy to be cynical. It isn't perfectly easy to be anything nowadays, old boy. There's such a lot of beastly competition about. Ah, that must be Aunt Augusta. Now, if I can get her out of the way for ten minutes or so so that you have the opportunity of proposing to Gwendolyn, may I dine with you at Melissa's tonight? I suppose so, if you want to. Yes, but you must be serious about it. I hate it when people aren't serious about meals. It's so shallow. Lady Bracknell and Miss Fairfax. Good afternoon, Algernon. I hope you are behaving very well. well. I'm feeling very well, Aunt Augusta. That's not quite the same thing now, is it? In fact, the two things rarely go together. Oh, dear me, you look smart. I am always smart. Aren't I, Mr. Wells? Oh, you're quite perfect, Miss Fairfax. Oh, I hope I'm not that. I would leave no room for developments. And I intend to develop in many directions. I'm, I'm sorry if we were a little late, Algernon. I was obliged to call on dear Lady Hardo. I hadn't been there since her poor husband's death. I must say, I've never seen a woman so altered. She looks quite 20 years younger. Now. I'll have some tea and one of those nice cucumber sandwiches you promised me. Oh, certainly, Aunt Augusta. Gwendolyn, why don't you come and sit here? Uh, thanks, Mama. I'm quite comfortable where I am. Lane, why are there no cucumber sandwiches? I ordered them specially. There were no cucumbers at the market this morning, sir. I went down twice. No cucumbers? No, sir. Not even for ready money. Thank you, Lane. That'll be all. Thank you, sir. I'm greatly distressed, Aunt Augusta. Uh, about there being no cucumbers, not even for ready money. It really makes no matter, Algernon. I have some crumpets for Lady Hargo, who seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure now. I hear her hair has turned quite gold for grief. Oh, it certainly has changed colour, but, but from what cause, I, of course, cannot say. I have quite a treat for you tonight, Algernon. I'm going to send you down with Mary Farquhar. She is such a delightful woman and so attentive to her husband. It is so nice to watch this. I am afraid, Aunt Augusta, that I shall have to give up the pleasure of dining with you this evening. I hope not, Algernon. It would put my table completely out. Your poor uncle would have to dine upstairs. Fortunately, he's accustomed to that. Well, it, it, it's a, a great displeasure to me, and I, I, I need hardly say a great bore, that I just received a telegram that my poor friend Bunbury is, is very ill again. They, they seem to think I should be with him. It is very strange. This, Mr. Bunbury seems to suffer from curiously bad health. Yes, poor Bunbury is a dreadful invalid. But it seems to me, Algernon, that it is high time this Mr. Bunbury made up his mind whether he is going to live or going to die. This shilly-shallying with the question is absurd. 
Nor do I in any way approve of the modern sympathy for invalids. I find it morbid. Illness of any kind is hardly a thing to be encouraged in others. Health is the primary duty of life. Uh, now, I would be much obliged if you would ask Mr. Bunbury from me if he could be so kind as to not to have a relapse on Saturday. For I rely on you to arrange my music for me. It is my last reception, and one wants something that encourages conversation. I'll, I'll speak to Bunbury and to Gusta if he's still conscious, but I think I can guarantee he'll be all right by Saturday. However, as far as the music is concerned, it's a, it's a great difficulty. You see, if one plays good music, people don't listen. And if one plays bad music, people don't talk. However, I will kindly go over the program I've drawn out if you'll follow me into the next room. Oh, thank you, Algernon. It is so thoughtful of you. Gwendolyn, you will accompany me. Certainly, Mama. Uh, charming day it's been, Miss Fairfax. Pray don't talk to me about the weather, Mr. Worthing. Whenever people talk to me about the weather, I always feel quite certain they mean something else. That makes me so nervous. I do mean something else. I thought so. In fact, I'm never wrong. I would like to be able to take advantage of Lady Bracknell's temporary absence. I would certainly invite you to do so. Mama has a way of coming back suddenly into a room that I've often had to speak to her about. Miss Fairfax, ever since I met you, I've admired you more than any girl I I've ever met since I met you. Oh, uh, uh, yes, I'm quite aware of the fact and I often wish that in public, at any rate, you had been more demonstrative. For me, you have always had an irresistible fascination. Even before I met you, I was far from indifferent to you. Oh, we live, as I hope you know, Mr. Webbing, in an age of ideals. The fact is constantly mentioned in the more expensive monthly magazines. I just reached the provincial pulpits, I'm told. And my ideal has always been to love someone of the name of Ernest. Oh, there is something in that name that inspires absolute confidence. The moment Algernon first mentioned to me that he had a friend called Ernest, I knew I was destined to love you. Gwendolyn, you really love me. Passionately. Oh, darling, you don't know how happy you've made me. Oh, my own Ernest. Yes, but you don't mean to say if my name wasn't Ernest, you couldn't love me then. But your name... Is that oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I know it is, but supposing it was something else, uh, do you mean to say you couldn't love me then? Uh, that is clearly a metaphysical speculation, and like most metaphysical speculations, has very little reference at all to the actual facts of real life as we know them. Uh, well, darling, to speak quite candidly, I don't much care for the name of Ernest. I don't think it suits me at all. It suits you perfectly. It is a divine name. It has a music of its own. It produces vibrations. <laughs> well, um, I, I think there are other much nicer names. I think um, well, well, Jack, for instance, is a charming name. Jack? <laughs> no. There is very little music of the name of Jack, if any at all indeed. It is not thrill, it produces absolutely no vibrations. I have known several Jacks, and they all without exception were more than usually plain. Besides, Jack is a notorious domesticity for John. I pity any woman who's married to a man called John. She would probably never be allowed to know the entrancing pleasure of a single moment's solitude. No, he only really saved him as Ernest. <laughs> Gwendolyn, I must get christened at once. I, I mean, we must get married at once. There's no time to be lost. Married, Mr. Worthing? Well, yes, sh surely you know that I love you and you've made it quite clear that you're not indifferent to me. I adore you, but you haven't proposed to me yet. Nothing's been said at all about marriage. The subject has not even been touched on. Uh, well, may I propose to you now? I think it would be an admirable <laughs> opportunity, <laughs> and to spare you any possible disappointment, Mr. Worthing, I think it's only fair to tell you quite frankly beforehand that I am fully determined to accept you. Oh, Gwendolyn. <laughs> yes, Mr. Worthing, what have you got to say to me? <laughs> but you know what I've got to say to you. Yes, but you don't say it. Yes, okay, sure, sure. Um, uh, 
Gwendolyn, mm. will you marry me? Of course I will, darling. <laughs> <laughs> how long you've been about it? I'm afraid you've very little experience in how to propose. Well, in one, you're the only one in the world I've ever loved. Oh, yes, <laughs> but men ought to propose for practice. I know my brother Gerald does, all my girlfriends tell me so. Oh, what a wonderfully blue eyes you have, Ernest. They are quite, quite blue. I hope you will always look at me just like that. Especially when there are other people present. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Worthing, rise from this semi-recumbent posture. It is most indecorous. Mama, I must beg you to retire. This is no place for you. Besides, Mr. Worthing has not quite finished yet. <laughs> finished what, may I ask? I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Oh, pardon me. You are not engaged to anyone. When you do become engaged, I, or your father, should his health permit, will inform you of the fact. An engagement should come on a young girl as a surprise, however pleasant or unpleasant the case may be. It is hardly a matter that she should be allowed to arrange for herself. Now, I have a few questions to put to you, Mr. Worthing. While I make my inquiries, you, Gwendolyn, will wait for me below in the carriage. Mama! The carriage, Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn! The carriage! Yes, Mama. Sit, Worthing. Uh, uh, thank you, Lady Brackle. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that your name is not down on the list of eligible young men. Although I do have the same list that the Duchess of Bolton has. We work together, in fact. However, I am prepared to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Now, do you smoke? I, yes, I must admit I smoke. I am glad to hear it. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? At 29. A very good age to be married at. Uh, uh, now, I have always said that when a man desires to get married, he should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I... I know nothing, Lady Brackley. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate, exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, it produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. Now, what is your income? Uh, between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or investments? Well, in investments, cheaply. That is satisfactory. I do have a house in the country as well with some lands attached to it, of course. Uh, about 1,500 acres, I believe. A country house? How many bedrooms? Uh, never mind, that could all be cleared up afterward. You have a townhouse, I presume. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature such as Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, yes, I, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it's led by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back at six months' notice whenever I like. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, well, she's a lady of uh, considerably advanced years, goes about very little. Oh, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. Oh, the unfashionable side. What are your politics? Oh, I'm afraid I really don't have any. I, I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us. Oh, Come in the evening, at any rate. Now, to more minor matters, are both your parents living? I've lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, could be regarded a misfortune. To lose both looks carelessness. Now, who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. I'm afraid, Lady Brackle, I, I really don't know. 
And when I said that I'd lost my parents, it'd be nearer to the truth to say that my parents seemed to have lost me. I don't know who I was from birth because, well, I was found. Found? Yes, uh, Mr. Thomas Cardew, an older gentleman of kind and, and charitable disposition, he, he found me and gave me the name of Worthing because, well, he happened to have a ticket to Worthing in his pocket at the time. Where did this charitable gentleman with a first class ticket find you? Well, in a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell, a, a handbag. It was a, a rather large brown leather handbag with handles attached to it. A, a, an ordinary handbag, in fact. And where did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew find this handbag? In the cloakroom of Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. A cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton Line. The line is immaterial! Mr. Worthing, I must confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born or at any rate bred in a handbag seems to show a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom in a railway station may have proved to cover a social indiscretion. Indeed, probably has been used for that before now. But it can hardly be regarded as an assured basis for recognised position in good society. May I ask then what you would recommend I do? I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolyn's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relation as soon as possible. And to produce, at any rate, one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. I don't see how I could possibly do that. I could produce the handbag at any moment. It's, it's in my dressing room at home. Surely that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What, what? What is it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I, or Lord Bracknell, would allow our one and only daughter, a girl raised with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. <sighs> Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Good morning. Pray, Algie, don't play that ghastly tune. How idiotic you are. Didn't it go off all right, old boy? Uh, you don't mean to say that Gwendolyn refused you. I, I know that's the way she has. She's always refusing people. I find it most ill-natured of her. No, Gwendolyn is as right as a trivet. A as far as she's concerned, we are engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. I've never met such a gorgon. I don't really know what a gorgon is like, but I am sure Lady Bracknell is one. And in any case, she is a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I, I beg your pardon, Algy. I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way in front of you. <laughs> don't mind it, old boy. I love hearing my relations abused. It's the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't the slightest idea of how to live, nor the remotest instinct on when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Uh, well, I'm not going to argue about it. I, I, you always want to argue about things. That's exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't think there's any chance of... Gwendolyn turning up like her mother in about 150 years, do you? All women become like their mothers. That's their tragedy. No, no man does. That's his. Is that clever? It's perfectly phrased and quite as clever as anything in civilized life oh, should be. I'm sick to death of cleverness. Everywhere you go, you meet clever people. It's becoming an absolute public nuisance. I just wish we had a few fools left. We have. Well, I'd very much like to meet them. What do they talk about? Oh, the fools? Clever people, of course. <laughs> what fools? Did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? <laughs> One does not blurt out the truth to a nice, young, sophisticated woman. What extraordinary ideas you have about how to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she's pretty, or to someone else if she's plain. Ooh. 
That is nonsense. But what about your, uh, your, your brother, the profligate Ernest? Oh, by the end of the week I'll have gotten rid of Ernest. I'll say that he died suddenly in Paris of, uh, apoplexy. Yes, yes. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's, uh, hereditary, the kind of thing that runs in families. You'd much better say a severe chill. But you're sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of the kind? Of course it isn't. Oh. Well, that settles it. My poor brother Ernest dies suddenly in Paris of a severe chill. I get rid of him. But uh, what about Miss Cardew? I thought you said that she was a little too fond of Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a great deal? <laughs> no. Cecily is not a silly romantic girl, I'm glad to say. She goes long walks, has capital appetite, and cares nothing at all about her lessons. I'd rather like to see Cecily. I'll make very good that you never do. She is excessively pretty and only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn that you have an excessively pretty ward who's only just 18? <laughs> it's not the sort of thing one works out to people. Uh, and, you know, Gwendolyn and Cecily are, are destined to be extremely great friends. I'll bet you anything you like that half an hour after they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. <laughs> Women only call each other that after they've <laughs> called each other a lot of other things first. Now, if we want to get a good table at Willis's, we really must go and dress. Did you know it's nearly seven? It's always nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. Well, what shall we do after dinner? Shall we go to the theatre? No, no, I love listening. Well, shall we go to the club? No, 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 I hate talking. Maybe we'll trot round to the Empire round ten? Oh, no. I can't look at things. It's so silly. Well, then what shall we do? Nothing. It's not a lot of hard work doing nothing. However, I don't mind hard work if there's no definite object of any kind. Miss Fairfax. Oh, Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algie, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Wellings. <laughs> really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algie, you always adopt a strictly more attitude towards life. You're not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had upon Mama, I lost at the age of three. But although she may be rented from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else, and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Oh. Dear Gwendolyn, the story of your romantic origin, as related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Your town address of the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? The Manor House, Walton, Hertfordshire. They have a good pose to service, I suppose. Uh, it may be necessary to do something desperate. <laughs> that, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. <laughs> yes, oh, my own one. Uh, how long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. <laughs> Algie, you may turn around now. Thanks, I've turned around already. You may also ring the bell. Oh, you let me see you get to your carriage, my own darling. Uh, certainly. <laughs> oh, I will see Miss Fairfax out. Glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Lane, tomorrow I'm going bunbury. I probably shan't be back until Monday. Yes, sir. You can go ahead and put away my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Oh, Lane, you are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. There is a sensible, intellectual young girl. The only girl I've ever cared for in my life. <laughs> what are you so amused at? <laughs> oh, I'm just a little uh, anxious about poor Bunbury, that's all. If you're not careful, your friend Bunbury's going to get you in a serious scrape someday. Oh, I love scrapes. They're the only thing that's never serious. Oh, that is nonsense. Algie, you don't talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does. Pleasures away.
way to you. But I don't like German. It isn't at all a becoming language. And I know perfectly well that I look quite plain after my German lesson. Child, you know how anxious your guardian is that you should improve yourself in every way. Indeed, he laid particular stress as he was leaving for town yesterday. Uncle Jack is so very serious. In fact, he's so serious that I think he cannot be quite well. Your guardian enjoys the best of health, and his gravity of demeanor is to be commended in one so comparatively young as he is. I know no one who has a higher sense of duty and responsibility. I suppose that is why he often looks a little more when we three are together? Cecily, I am surprised at you. Mr. Worthing has many troubles in his life. Idle merriment and triviality would be out of place in his conversation. And you must remember his constant anxiety about that unfortunate young man, his brother. I do wish Uncle Jack would allow that unfortunate young man, his brother, to come down here sometimes. We might have a good influence over him, Miss Prism. I am sure you certainly would. You know German and geology and things of that kind influence a man very much. Well, I do not think that even I could produce any effect on a character that, according to his own brother's admission, is irretrievably weak and vacillating. Indeed, I'm not sure I would even desire to reclaim him. I'm not in favor of this modern mania of turning bad people to good people at a moment's notice. As a man so, so let him reap. Really, you must put away your diary, Cecily. I don't see why you should keep a diary at all. I keep a diary in order to enter the wonderful secrets of my life. If I didn't write them down, I should probably forget all about them. Memory, my dear Cecily, is the diary that we all carry about with us. Yes, but it usually chronicles the things that have never happened and couldn't possibly have happened. I believe that memory is responsible for nearly all the three-volume novels that Moody sends us. Do not speak slightingly of the three-volume novel, Cecily. I wrote one myself in earlier days. Did you really, Miss Prism? Oh, how wonderfully clever you are. I hope it did not end happily. I don't like novels that end happily. The good ended happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means. I suppose so, but it seems very unfair. Oh, was your novel ever published? Alas, no. The manuscript, I'm afraid, was abandoned. I use the word in the sense of lost or mislaid. <laughs> now, to your work, child, these speculations are profitless. But I see dear Dr. Chasuble coming up through the garden. Dr. Chasuble! <laughs> this is indeed a pleasure! <laughs> and how are we this morning? <laughs> Miss Prism, I trust you are well. Has just been complaining of a slight heading. I think it would do her so much good if you had a short stroll through to the park, Dr. Charles. I have not mentioned anything about a headache. Uh, no, dear Miss Prism, I know that, but I felt it instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that and not about my German lesson when the rector came in. Cecily, I hope you are not inattentive. Oh, That is strange. Were I fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pupil, I would hang upon her lips. Uh, oh, uh, I spoke metaphorically, of course. My metaphor was drawn from uh, bees. Uh, um, Mr. Worthing has yet to return from town, I suppose. Uh, we do not expect him till Monday afternoon. Ah, yes. Mr. Worthing likes to spend his Sundays in London. But I must not disturb Egeria and her pupil any longer. Egeria? My name is Leticia, Doctor. Oh, a classical allusion merely, drawn from the pagan authors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I shall no doubt see you both at Evensong. I think, dear Doctor, that I will have that show with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it some good. With pleasure, Miss Prism, with pleasure. We may go as far as the schools and back. Oh, how delightful! Cecily, you will read your political economy in my absence! Mm, horrid political economy! Horrid, horrid German! Mr. Ernest Worthing has just driven over from the station. He has brought his luggage with him. Mr. Ernest Worthing, before the Albany W. Uncle Jack's brother! Did you tell him Mr. Worthing was in town? Yes, ma'am. He 
remain very much disappointed. I mentioned that you and Miss Prism were in the garden. He said he was anxious to speak to you privately for a moment. Ask Mr. Worthing to come here. I suppose you'd better talk to the housekeeper about a room for him. Yes, miss. my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. Uh, you are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I'm more than usually tall for my age. But um, I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother. My cousin Ernest, my wicked cousin Ernest. Well, I'm not really wicked, Cecily. You mustn't think that I'm wicked. Oh, well, if you are not, then you have certainly been deceiving us all in a very inexcusable manner. I hope you've not been leaving a double life, pretending to be wicked and being really good all the time. That would be hypocrisy. Well, I have been rather, um, reckless. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. In fact, now that you mention it, I have been very bad in my own small way. Oh, I don't think you should be so proud of that. Though I am sure it must have been very pleasant. It's much pleasanter being here with you. <laughs> I can't understand how you're here at all. Uncle Jack will be back until Monday afternoon. Oh, that is a great disappointment. I'm obliged to go up by the first train on Monday morning. I have a business arrangement that I'm anxious to miss. Oh. Well, I know how important it is not to keep a business engagement if anyone wants to retain any sense of the beauty of life. But still, I think you had better wait until Uncle Jack arrives. I know he wants to speak to you about your emigrating. My what? You're emigrating. He's gone up to buy your outfit. I certainly wouldn't let Jack buy my outfit. He has no taste in neckties at all. I don't think you'll require neckties. Uncle Jack is sending you to Australia. Australia? I'd sooner die. Well, he said at dinner on Wednesday night that you would have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. This world's good enough for me, Cecily. Yes, but are you good enough for it? I'm afraid I'm not that. That's why I want you to reform me. Oh. You might make that your mission, if you don't mind, Cousin Cecily. I'm afraid I have no time this afternoon. Would you uh, mind me reforming myself this afternoon? It is rather quixotic of you, but I think you should try. I will. I feel better already. You are looking a little worse. That's because I'm hungry. Oh, how thoughtless of me. I should have remembered that when one is to lead an entirely new life, one requires regular and wholesome meals. Won't you come in? Yes, but may I have a pink rose first? <laughs> Why? Because you like a pink rose, Cousin Cecily. Oh, I don't think it can be right for you to talk to me like that. <laughs> Miss Prism never says such things to me. Well, then Miss Prism is a short-sighted old lady. You're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Miss Prism says that all good looks are a snare. They're a snare that any sensible man would like to be caught in. <laughs> I don't think I could care to catch a sensible man. I shouldn't know what to talk to him about. <laughs> <laughs> you are too much alone, dear Dr. Chasuble. You should be married. Married? The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. Well, perhaps that is why the primitive church has not messed it up to the present day. A man should be more careful that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Oh. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. Oh. But is a man not equally attractive when married? <laughs> no married man is ever attractive, except to his wife. <laughs> and often I'm told not even to her. <laughs> that depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can be trusted, ripeness can be depended on. You women are green. Oh! Oh. <laughs> I spoke uh, horticulturally, of course. Uh, my metaphor was drawn from fruits. Uh, but where is Cecily? Uh, perhaps she followed us to the schools. Uh, uh. Uh, Mr. Worthy! 
wedding. Mr. Worthy. Oh, this is indeed a surprise we did not expect you till Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than I expected. Dr. Chosswell, I hope you will. Mr. Worthing, I, I do hope that this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. More shameful deaths and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead. Your brother Ernest, dead? Quite dead. Oh. Well, what a lesson for him. I trust he will profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolence. You've at least the consolation of knowing that you were the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Uh, poor Ernest was... had many faults, but this is a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him in the end? No. He died abroad, in Paris, in fact. I got a telegram last night from the manager of the Grand Hotel. Oh. Was the cause of death mentioned? A, a severe chill, it seems. Well, as a man so, so shall he be. Charity, Miss Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to the cold. <sighs> Will the internment take place here? Oh, no, he, he seemed to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? Oh, oh, I fear that hardly points to any very serious state of mind at the last. Oh, you would no doubt wish for me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday? My sermon on the meaning of the manor in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion, be it joyful or in this present case, distressing. I've delivered it on several occasions, at harvest celebrations, confirmations, christenings, days of humiliation, and festal days. The last time I delivered it was as a charity sermon on behalf of the Society of Prevention of Discontent among the Upper Orders. The bishop who was present was very struck by the analogies that I drew. Yes, that reminds me. I, I think you said something about christenings, Dr. Chaucerville. Uh, you are continually christening, of course, aren't you? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in this parish. I have often spoken to the poor classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what thrift is. But is there any infant in whom you're particularly interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother was, I believe, unmarried, was he not? Oh, yes. People who live entirely for pleasure usually are. But it's not for any child, dear doctor. I, I mean, I'm very fond of children, but no, the fact of the matter is I'd like to be christened myself this afternoon if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you've been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. Have you any grave doubts upon the subject? I certainly intend to have. But maybe you're not interested in this type of thing, or you think I'm a little too old now. Oh, no, 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 not at all. The sprinkling, and indeed the immersion of adults, is a perfectly canonical practice. The immersion? You need have no apprehensions. Sprinkling is indeed all that is necessary, or I think advisable. At what hour would you wish the ceremony performed? Oh, I might trot round about five o'clock if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. I have two very similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A case of twins, in fact, that occurred in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate to Paul Jenkins the Carter, a most hard-looking man. No, I, I don't think I would like to be christened along with other babies. It would be childish. So oh. would uh, half past five do? Mm. Admirably, admirably. <laughs> and now, Mr. Worthing, I will no longer intrude upon a house of sorrow. I would merely beg that you be not too bowed down by grief. What seem to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This 
seems to me a blessing of the most obvious kind. <coughs> Uncle Jack! Oh, I am pleased to see you back. Oh, but what horrid clothes you've got on. Do go and change them. Cecily! My child, my child. Oh, Uncle Jack, what is the matter? Do look happy. You look as if you had toothache. And I've got such a surprise for you. Who do you think is in the dining room? Your brother! Who? Your brother Ernest. He arrived about half an hour ago. What nonsense? I haven't got the brother. Oh, Uncle Jack, don't say that. However badly he may have treated you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I'll tell him to come out, and you will shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. After we'd all been resigned to his loss, his sudden reappearance seems to me peculiarly distressing. My brother is in the dining room. I, I don't know what this all means. I, I can't figure it out. It seems absurd. Oh, good heavens. Brother John, I've come up from town expressly to tell you that I'm sorry for any trouble I've caused you, and I intend to lead a better life in the future. Uncle Jack, you aren't going to refuse your own brother's hand. Nothing will induce me to take his hand. I think he is coming down here a disgrace, and he knows perfectly well why. Uncle Jack, do be nice. Why, Ernest has just been telling me about his poor invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, whom he goes to visit so often. And surely there must be much good in one who is kind to an invalid who leaves the pleasures of London to sit by a bed of pain. Bunbury. He's been talking about Bunbury, has he? Yes. He has told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Well, I won't have him talk to you about Bunbury or about anything else. It's enough to drive one perfectly frantic. Well, I admit the faults were all on my side, but I must say I find Brother John's coldness to me peculiarly painful. I expected a more enthusiastic welcome, especially considering it's the first time I've been here. Oh, Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will... Never forgive you! Never forgive me? Never, never, never! Well, this is the last time I shall ever do it. <gasps> it is wonderful, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? <laughs> I think we might leave the two brothers together. Yes, Cecily, you will come with us. Certainly, Miss Prism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. Mm, we must not be premature in our judgment. I feel very happy. Algy, you must leave this place at once. I do not allow any bun bearing here. I have put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to yours, sir. I suppose that is all right. What? Mr. Ernest's luggage, sir. I have unpacked it and put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes, sir. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hot boxes, oh and a large luncheon basket. I'm afraid I can't stay more than a week this time. Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful liar you are, Jack. I haven't been called to town at all. Yes, you have. I haven't heard anyone call me. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasure in the smallest degree. <laughs> I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You will not talk of Miss Cardew like that. I don't like it. Well, I don't like your clothes. Why on earth don't you go up and change? You look perfectly ridiculous in them. It's, it's absurd to be in deep mourning for someone who's actually staying with you in your house for an entire week as a guest. I call it grotesque. Oh, you are not to stay with me for a week as a guest or anything else. You have got to go by the 4-5 train. Well, I certainly won't go while you're in deep mourning. It would be most unkind. You'd stay with me if I were in deep mourning, I, I assume. Well, I would think it most unfriendly if you didn't. Will you go if I change my clothes? Yes, if you're not too long about it. I've never seen someone take so long to dress and with such little results. 
In any fact, it is all better than being always overdressed as you are. If I am occasionally overdressed, I always make up for it by being immensely overeducated. Your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct and outrage and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you have got to catch the 4-5, and I hope you have a pleasant journey back to town. This bun bearing, as you call it, hasn't been a great success for you. Well, I think it has been a great success. I'm in love with Cecily, and that is everything. But I must see her before I go and make arrangements for another Bunbury. Oh, there she is. Oh, I really came back to water the roses. I thought you were with Uncle Jack. He's got this in the dog cart for me. We have got to part? I'm afraid so. A very painful parting. It is always painful to part from one who is known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, but even a momentary separation from anyone to whom has just been introduced is almost unbearable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the dog cart is waiting for you, sir. It can wait, Merriman, for five minutes. Yes, miss. Cecily, I hope I don't offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness does you great credit, Ernest. If you'll allow me to copy your remarks into my diary. Oh, do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it, may I? No, no. It is simply a young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. But I hope you'll order a copy when it appears in volume form. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection. You can go on. I'm quite ready for more. Um. <coughs> oh, no, don't cough, Ernest. Whenever one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell cough. Cecily, ever since I looked upon your wonderful, incomparable beauty, I've dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Um, I don't think that you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, and hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. The dog cart is waiting, sir. Tell it to come around next week at the same hour. Yes, sir. Uncle Jack will be very much annoyed if you knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. Oh, I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anyone in the world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me, won't you? Oh, you silly boy, of course. Why, we've been engaged for the last three months. For the last three months? Yes. It'll be exactly three months on Thursday. But, uh, Cecily, how did we become engaged? Well, ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who is very wicked and bad, you, of course, have performed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prison. And of course, a man who is much talked about is always very attractive. <laughs> I dare say it was foolish of me, but I fell in love with you, Ernest. <laughs> but when, when was our engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last, worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I decided to end the matter one way or another. And after a long struggle with myself, I finally accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name with the bangle of the true lover's knot I promised you always to wear. Oh, did I get you this? It's, it's very pretty, isn't it? Yes, you have wonderfully good taste, Ernest. It's the excuse I've always given you for leading such a bad life. Oh, and this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. Oh, my letters? But, Cecily, I haven't written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest! Cecily, do let me read them. Oh, no, I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I've broken off the engagement are written so beautiful and so badly spelled that I can hardly read them without crying a little. But was our engagement ever broken off? Of course it was. On the 22nd of last March. Oh, you could read that entry if you like. Um, ah. Today, I broke off my engagement with Ernest. I feel it is better to do so. The weather still continues charming. Cecily, what had I done? I, I had done nothing, Cecily. I, 
I'm quite hurt, Cecily, to hear you broke off our engagement, particularly when the weather was so charming. Well, it would hardly have been a serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once. But I forgave you before the week was out. Oh, what a perfect angel you are, Cecily. <laughs> My dear romantic boy, I hope your hair grows naturally, does it? Uh, uh, yes, uh, with, with some help from uh, others. Oh, I'm so glad. You'll never break off our engagement again, will you, Cecily? I don't think I can break it off now that I've actually met you. Besides, there is the question of your name. Yes, of course. <laughs> you must not laugh at me, darling. But it has always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. There's just something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. Well, Cecily, you don't mean to say that you couldn't love me if I had some other name. But what other name? Oh, any name you like. Uh, Algernon, for instance. Oh, I do not like the name of Algernon. But, uh, Cecily, I don't see why you should object to the name of Algernon at all. It's, it's not a bad name. In fact, it's a rather aristocratic name. Half the chaps who make it into the bankruptcy court are called Algernon. But really, Cecily, if, if my name were Algy, couldn't you love me? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character, but I fear I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. Cecily, your, your rector here is uh, well practiced in all the rites and ceremonials of the church, yes? Ah, yes. Dr. Chasuble is a most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. I must see him at once on a most important christening, uh, on most important uh, business. Oh. I shan't be away for more than half an hour. Considering that we've been engaged since February the 14th, and that I only met you today for the first time, I think it is rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I'll be back in no time. <laughs> what an impetuous boy he is. I like his hair so much. I must enter his proposal into my diary. On this fair fact, just called to see Mr. Worthing on very important business, Miss Fairfax states. Is it Mr. Worthing in his library? Mr. Worthing went over in the direction of the rectory some time ago. Hmm. Pray, ask the lady to come out here. Mr. Worthing is sure to be back soon. Yes, miss. Oh, and you can bring tea. Yes, miss. Miss Fairfax. I suppose one of the many good elderly women who are associated with Uncle Jack and his philanthropic work in London. I don't quite like women who are interested in philanthropic work. I think it is so forward of them. Miss Fairfax. myself to you. Uh, my name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew? <laughs> what a very sweet name. Something tells me we're going to be great. Uh, I like you already more than I can say. And my first impressions of people are never wrong. Uh, how nice of you to like me so much after we've known each other for such a comparatively short time. Uh, pray, sit down. I may call you Cecily, may I not? Uh, with pleasure. And you will always call me Gwendolyn, won't you? If you wish. <laughs> and that is all quite settled, is it not? <laughs> I hope so. <clears throat> Perhaps this might be a favourable opportunity for my mentioning who I am. My father is Lord Bracknell. <laughs> you have never heard of Papa, I suppose. I don't think so. <laughs> well, outside the family circle, Papa, I am glad to say, is entirely unknown. I think that is quite as it should be. The hope seems to me to be the proper sphere for the man. And certainly, once a man begins to neglect his domestic duties, he becomes painfully effeminate, does he not? And I don't like that. It makes men so very attractive. <laughs> Cecily, Mama, whose views on education are remarkably strict, has brought me up to be extremely short-sighted. It is part of a system. 
So do you mind if I look at you through my glasses? Oh, not at all, Gwendolyn. I am very fond of being looked at. Out or some female relative of advanced years. Is I here also? Oh, no, I have no mother, nor in fact any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian, with the assistance of Miss Prism, has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes. I am Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh. <laughs> it is strange he never mentioned to me that he had a ward. How secretive of him he grows more interesting hourly. <laughs> I am not sure, however, that the news inspires me with feelings of unmixed delight. I am very fond of you, Cecily. I've liked you ever since I met you. But I feel bound to state that, now that I know that you're Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were, well, uh, just a little older than you seem to be, and not quite so very alluring in appearance. In fact, if I may speak candidly... Oh, pray do! I think that whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. <laughs> well, to speak with perfect candour, Cecily, I wish that you were fully 42 and more than you should be paying for your age. Ernest has a strong upright nature. He is the very soul of truth and honour. Disloyalty would be as impossible to him as deception. But even men of the noblest possible moral character are extremely susceptible to the influence of the physical charms of others. Modern, no less than ancient history, supplies us with many most painful examples of what I refer to. Were not so, indeed, history would be quite unreadable. I beg your pardon, <laughs> Gwendolyn. Um, but did you say Ernest? Yes. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Ernest ever mentioned to me that he had a brother. I'm sorry to say they have not been on good terms for a long time. Ah, oh, that accounts for it. And now that I think of it, I've never heard any man mention his brother. The subject seems distasteful to most men. Oh, Cecily, you have lifted a load from my mind. I was beginning to grow almost anxious. It would have been terrible if any cloud had come across a friendship like ours, would it not? <laughs> of course, you are quite, quite sure that it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian? Quite sure. <laughs> In fact, I'm going to be his. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Dearest Gwendolyn, there is no reason why I should make it a secret of it to you. Our little country newspaper is sure to chronicle the fact next week. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. Oh, my darling Cecily, I'm afraid there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the very latest. I believe you're under some strange misconception. Why, well, Ernest just proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. It is certainly very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. If you would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read on the train. Oh, I'm so sorry, dear Cecily. If it is any disappointment to you, but I'm afraid that I have the prior claim. <laughs> it would distress me more than I can tell you, dear Gwendolyn, that if it should cause you any mental or physical anguish, but I feel bound to point out that since Ernest proposed to you, he clearly has changed his mind. If the poor fellow has been entrapped into any foolish promise, I shall consider it my duty to rescue her at once. And with a firm hand. Whatever unfortunate entanglement my dear boy may have gotten into, I will never reproach him with it after we are married. Do you allude to me, Miss Cardew, as an entanglement? You are presumptuous. On an occasion of this kind, it becomes more than a moral duty to speak one's mind, it becomes a pleasure. Do you suggest, Miss Fairfax, that I attract Ernest into an engagement? How dare you? This is no time for wearing this shallow mask of manners. When I see a spade, I call it a spade. Well, I'm glad to say that I've never seen a spade. It is obvious that the social spheres have been 
and widely different. Can I wait to be here as usual, miss? Yes, as usual. Yes, as usual. Are there many interesting walks in the vicinity of Miss Cardinal? Oh, yes, a great many. <laughs> From the top of one of the hills quite close, one can see five counties. Five counties? No, I don't think I should like that. I suppose that is why you live in town. Quite a well-kept garden this is, Miss Cardew. So glad you like it, Miss Fogg. I had no idea there were any flowers in the country. Oh, flowers are as common here, Miss Fairfax, as people are in London. Personally, I cannot understand how anyone manages to exist in the country. If anybody who is, anybody does. The country always bores me to death. Ah, uh, this is what the newspaper call agricultural depression, is it not? I believe the aristocracy are suffering very much from it just at present. It is almost an epidemic amongst them, I've been told. May I offer you some tea, Miss Fairfax? Thank you. <laughs> Detestable girl! But I require the tea. Sugar? Oh, no, thank you. Sugar is not fashionable anymore. seen at the best houses nowadays. Hand that to Miss Fairfax. <laughs> you have filled my tea with lumps of sugar and though I ask no succinctly for bread and butter, you have given me cake. I know. But the gentleness of my disposition and the extraordinary sweetness of my nature. But I warn you, Miss Cardew, you may go too far. To save my poor, innocent, trusting boy from the machinations of any other girl, there are no lanes to which I would not go. From the moment I first saw you, I distrusted you. I felt that you were false and deceitful. I am never deceived in such matters. My first impressions of people are invariably right. It seems to me, Miss Fairfax, that I am trespassing on your value in time. Surely you have many other cause of a similar character to make in the neighborhood. Ernest! <laughs> My own Ernest. Dear Gwendolyn. Oh, a moment. May I ask if you are engaged to be married to this young lady? <laughs> Dear little Cecily. Of course not. I could have put an idea into your pretty little head. Thank you. You may. I knew there must be some misunderstanding, Miss Fairfax. The gentleman whose arm is at present around your waist is my dear guardian, Mr. John Worthing. I beg your pardon. This is Uncle Jack. Jack? Oh. Oh, love. A moment, Ernest. May I ask, are you engaged to be married to this young lady? To what young lady? Oh, good heavens, Gwendolyn. Yes, to good heavens, Gwendolyn. I mean to Gwendolyn. Oh, of course not. What could have put such an idea in your pretty little head? Thank you. You may. <laughs> I felt there was some slight error, Miss Cardew. The gentleman who is now embracing you is my cousin. Mr. Algernon Moncrief. Algernon Moncrief? Oh! Are you called Algernon? I cannot deny it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Is your name really John? I could deny it if I liked. I could deny anything if I liked, but my name certainly is John. It's been John for years. A gross deception has been my poor wounded Cecily. My sweet wronged Gwendolyn. You will call me sister, will you not? There is just one question I should be allowed to ask my guardian. An admirable idea, Mr. Worthing. There is just one question I would like to be permitted to put to you. Where is your brother Ernest? 
We are both engaged to be married to your brother Ernest, so it is a matter of some importance to us to know where your brother Ernest is at present. Uh, Gwendolyn, C C Cecily, it pains me to speak the truth. Uh, I've never been reduced to such a painful position in all of my life. And to be quite frank, I I'm not very good at anything of the kind. <coughs> However, uh, I must say that I have no brother Ernest. I have no brother at all. I never had a brother, and I certainly don't intend to have one in the future. No brother at all? None. Had you never a brother of any kind? Never! Not even of any kind. I'm afraid it is quite clear, Cecily, that neither of us is engaged to be married to anyone. It is not a very pleasant position for a young girl suddenly to find herself in, is it? Let us go into the house. They will hardly venture to come after us there. No. Men are so cowardly, aren't they? This ghastly state of things is what you call bunburying, I suppose. Yes, and a wonderful bunbury it is. The most wonderful bunbury I've had in my life. Well, you have no right whatsoever to bunbury here. That is absurd. One has a right to bunbury wherever one chooses. Every serious bunburyist knows it. Serious bunburyist? Good heavens! Well, one must be serious about something if one wants to have any amusement in life. What do you happen to be serious about? I haven't the slightest idea about everything I should fancy. You have an absolutely trivial nature. Well, the only small satisfaction I get out of the whole of this wretched business is that your friend Bunbury is quite exploded. You won't be able to run down to the country as often as you like to, Algy, and it's uh, a good thing, too. Well, your brother's a little off color, isn't he, Jack? You won't be able to disappear off to London quite so often as your wicked custom was. Well, not a bad thing, either. As for your conduct to Miss Cardew, I think you're taking in a sweet, innocent, simple girl like that. Inexcusable. Well, I can see no possible defense for your taking in a brilliant, clever, thoroughly experienced young girl like Miss Fairfax, to say nothing of the fact that she's my cousin. I wanted to be engaged to Gwendolyn, and that is all. Well, I wanted to be engaged to Cecily. Oh. I adore her. You will not marry Miss Cardew. <laughs> well, I don't see there being much chance of you and Miss Fairfax being united. That is not your business. If it were my business, I wouldn't talk about it. Only people like stockbrokers do that, and even then, maybe at dinner parties. How you can sit there, calmly eating muffins, when we're in this horrible trouble I can't make out. You seem to me to be perfectly heartless. But I can't eat muffins in an agitated manner. The, the butter might get on my cuffs. One should always eat muffins calmly. It's the only way to eat them. I say. Your eating muffins at all is perfectly heartless under the circumstances. But whenever I am upset, I eat. As, as a matter of fact, whenever I'm greatly upset, as anyone who knows me intimately will tell you, I refuse anything but food and drink. At the present moment, I'm eating muffins because I'm unhappy. Besides, I'm particularly fond of muffins. Yes, but that's not a reason for you to eat them all in that greedy way. Why don't you have some tea cake? I hate tea cake. Surely a man may eat his own muffins in his own garden. But you just said it was perfectly heartless to eat muffins. Yes, perfectly heartless of you, under the circumstances. That's a completely different story. Well, that may be, but the muffins are the same. Algy, I wish to goodness that you would go. You can't ask me to go without having some dinner first. I never go without my dinner. Nobody has a, ever does except for vegetarians and people like that. Besides, I've got an appointment to be christened at a quarter to six under the name of Ernest. <laughs> my dear fellow, the sooner you give up that nonsense, the better. I made arrangements this morning with Dr. Chasuble to be christened myself at 5.30. And naturally, I will take the name of Ernest. Gwendolyn would wish it. We can't both be christened Ernest, that is absurd. Besides, I had a perfect right to be christened if I like. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that I was ever christened by anybody, and I think it extremely probable I never was. So does Dr. Chaucer. 
In your case, it's entirely different. You've been christened already. Yes, but I haven't been christened in years. Yes, but you have been christened. That's the important thing. Exactly. So I know my constitution can stand it. If you're not quite sure of your having ever been christened, I find it quite dangerous you're venturing on it now. It could make you very unwell. You can hardly forget that someone in your family was nearly carried, carried off this week in Paris by a severe chill. You said a severe chill is not hereditary. It used to be, I admit, but I dare say it is now. Science is always making great improvements in things. Oh, that is nonsense, Algy. You're always talking nonsense. Oh, but you're at the muffins again. I wish you wouldn't. I've already told you I'm particularly fond of muffins, and there's only two left. Have some tea cake. I hate tea cake. Then why on earth do you allow it to be served up for your guests? What idea you have of hospitality? Algy, I've already asked you to leave. I don't want you here. Why don't you go? I haven't quite finished my tea yet, and there's still one muffin left. The fact that they did not follow us at once into the house, as anyone else would have done, seems to me to show that they have some sense of shame left. They have been eating muffins. That looks like repentance. They don't seem to notice us at all. Couldn't you cough? But I haven't got a cough. They're looking at us. What effrontery. They're approaching. That's very forward of them. Let us preserve a dignified silence. Certainly. It is the only thing to do now. Silence seems to produce an unpleasant effect. A most distasteful one. But we shall not be the first to speak. Certainly not. <laughs> Mr. Worthing, I have something very particular to ask you. Much depends on your reply. Gwendolyn, your common sense is invaluable. Mr. Moncrief, kindly answer me the following question. Why did you pretend to be my guardian's brother? In order that I might have the opportunity of meeting you. That certainly seems a satisfactory explanation, does it not? Yes, dear, if you can believe him. I don't. But that does not affect the wonderful beauty of his answer. True, in matters of grave importance, style, not sincerity, is the vital thing. <clears throat> Mr. Worthy. What explanation can you offer me for pretending to have a brother? Was it in order that you might have an opportunity of coming up to town to see me as often as possible? Can you doubt it, Miss Fairfax? I have the gravest doubts upon the subject, but I intend to crush them. This is not the moment for German skepticism. Their explanations appear to be quite satisfactory, especially Mr. Worthing. That seems to me to have the stamp of truth upon it. I am more than content with what Mr. Moncrief has said. His voice alone seems to inspire one with absolute credulity. Then you think we should forgive them? Yes! I mean, no. <laughs> True, I had forgotten. There are principles at stake that one cannot surrender. Which of us should tell them? The task is not a pleasant one. Hmm. Could we not both speak at the same time? An excellent idea. I nearly always speak at the same time as other people. Will you take the time from me? Certainly. Your Christian names are still an insuperable barrier. That is all. Our, Our Christian, Christian names? Names? Is, is that all? That's all? We are We're going, going to be christened, christened this, this, after this afternoon. afternoon. Oh, oh, I think you're prepared to do this terrible thing. I am. To please me, you're ready to face this fearful ordeal? I am. How oh, absurd to talk of the equality of the sexes. What questions of self-sacrifice are concerned? Men are infinite and beyond us. We, we are. are. They have moments of physical courage of which we women know absolutely nothing. Oh, darling. Oh, darling. <laughs> <coughs> Lady Bracknell. Oh, good heavens. Uh, Gwen 
Gwendolyn! What does this mean? Merely that I am engaged to Mr. Worthing, Mama. Come here. Sit down! Sit down immediately! Hesitation of any kind is a sign of mental decay in the young and of physical weakness in the old. Apprised, sir, of my daughter's sudden flight by her trusty maid, whose confidence I purchased by means of a small coin, I followed her at once by a luggage train. Her unhappy father, I am glad to say, is under the impression she is attending a more than usually lengthy lecture at the University Extension Scheme on the importance of a permanent income on thought. I do not intend to undeceive him. But you, sir, will certainly understand that all communication between yourself and my daughter will cease from this moment immediately. On this point, as indeed on all points, I am firm. But I'm engaged to be married to Gwendolyn Lady Brown. <laughs> you are nothing of the kind, sir. And now as in regards Algernon. Oh, yes, sir, to God, sir. May I ask if it is in this house that your invalid friend, Mr. Bunbury, resides? Oh, uh, Bunbury? No, 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 Bunbury's not here at the present. Uh, in fact, Bunbury lives somewhere else. Uh, you know, Bunbury's dead. Dead? When did Mr. Bunbury die? His death must have been extremely sudden. Oh, well, you see, I killed Bunbury this afternoon. I mean, uh, Bunbury died this afternoon. What did he die of? Uh, oh, Bunbury? Huh. Uh, Bunbury, uh, he was quite, um... Exploded. Exploded? Uh, was he the victim of a revolutionary outrage? I was not aware that Mr. Bunbury was interested in social legislation. If so, he is well punished for his morbidity. Oh, no, Aunt Augusta. What I mean is Bunbury was found out. See, the doctors found out that Bunbury couldn't live, and so Bunbury died. <laughs> He must have had great confidence in the opinion of his physicians. I, I am glad, however, he made up his mind at the last to some definite course of action and acted on proper medical advice. And now that we're finally rid of this Mr. Bunbury, may I ask, Mr. Worthy, who is that young person whose hand my nephew Algernon is holding in what seems to me a most peculiarly unnecessary manner? Yes, that lady is uh, young Miss Cecily Cardew, my ward. I'm engaged to be married to Cecily, Aunt Augusta. Pardon me? Mr. Moncrief and I are engaged to be married, Lady Bracknell. Oh, I do not know if there is anything peculiarly exciting in the air in this particular part of Hertfordshire, but the number of engagements that occur seem to me to be well above the proper average. Mr. Worthy, is Miss Cardew in any way related to any of the larger railway stations in London? I only ask because until yesterday I was unaware of any families or persons whose origin was a terminal. Uh, Miss Cardew is the granddaughter of the late Mr. Thomas Cardew, of 149 Belgrave Square, SW, Dorking, Surrey, and is four and five shire in B. Hmm. That is not unsatisfactory. Three addresses always inspires confidence, even in tradesmen. Miss Cardew's family solicitors are Messrs. Markby, Markby, and Markby. Markby, Markby, and Markby. A firm of the highest position in their profession. Indeed, I am told that on occasion one of the Mr. Markby's is to be seen at dinner parties. So far, I am satisfied. Oh, how extremely kind of you, Lady Bracknell. I also have in my possession, you'll be pleased to hear, Certificates of Miss Cardew's birth, baptism, whooping cough, registration, vaccination, confirmation, and the measles. Both the German and the English variety. Ah, a life crowded with incident, I see. Though perhaps somewhat too exciting for a young girl. I myself am not in favour of premature experiences. I, come, Gwendolyn, the time approaches for our departure. We have not a moment to lose. I should ask, Mr. Worthing, if Miss Cardew has any little fortune to speak of. Oh, about £130,000 in the funds. That's all. Good to see you, A lady. moment, Mr. Worthing. £130,000. And in the funds. Miss Cardew seems a most attractive young lady now that I've had a look at her. Come over here, dear. Pretty 
child. Uh, your dress is sadly simple, but your hair looks as though nature might have left it. But all of that could easily be altered. A fairly experienced French maid produces a really marvelous result in a very brief space of time. I remember recommending one to young Lady Lansing, and after three months, her own husband did not know her. <laughs> yes, in six months, nobody knew her. <laughs> <laughs> Kindly turn around, dear. No, the side view is what I want. Quite as I expected, there are distinct social possibilities in your profile. The two weak points of our age are its want of principle and its want of profile. The chin a little higher, dear. Style largely depends on the way the chin is worn, and they are worn quite high at the present. Algernon? Yes, Aunt Augusta? There are distinct social possibilities in Miss Cardew's profile. Cecily is the sweetest dearest, prettiest woman I've ever seen. And I don't care two pence about social possibilities. Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. Only those who can get into it do that. But, dear child, of course you know that Algernon has nothing but his debt to depend upon. But I am not in favour of mercenary marriages. When I married Lord Bracknell, I had no fortune of any kind. But I never dreamed for a moment of allowing her to stand in my way. Well, I suppose I must give my consent. Oh, thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may kiss me, Cecily. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. You may also address me as Aunt Augusta for the future. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. The wedding, I think, had better take place quite soon. Oh, thank you, Aunt Augusta. Thank you, Aunt Augusta. To speak frankly, I am not in favour of long engagements. It gives people the opportunity of finding out each other's character before marriage, which I think is never advisable. I, I beg your pardon, Lady Bracknell, for interrupting you, but this engagement is quite out of the question. I am Miss Cardew's guardian. Without my consent, she may not marry until she comes of legal aid. That consent I absolutely decline to give. Upon what grounds, may I ask? Algernon is an extremely, I may even say, ostentatiously eligible young man. He has nothing, but he looks everything. What more can one desire? It pains me very deeply to have to speak frankly to you, Lady Bracknell, about your nephew. But I do not approve of his moral character. I suspect him of being untruthful. Untruthful? My nephew Algernon? Impossible. He is an Oxonian. Oh, I fear there can be no doubt about the matter. This afternoon, during my temporary absence in London on an important question of romance, he obtained access to my house under pre false pretense of being my brother. Continuing his disgraceful deception, he succeeded in the course of the afternoon of alienating the affections of my only ward. He subsequently stayed to tea, where he devoured every single muffin. And what makes his conduct all the more heartless is that he knew from the first that I have no brother. I never had a brother, and I don't intend to have a brother, not even of any kind. I told him so myself distinctly yesterday afternoon. <clears throat> Mr. Worthy, after careful consideration, I have decided entirely to overlook my nephew's conduct to you. <laughs> How very generous of you, Lady Bracknell. Uh, my decision, however, is unalterable. I decline to give my consent. Come here, dear. How old are you, dear? Well, I really am only 18, but I always admit to 20 when I go to evening parties. You are quite right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be perfectly accurate about her age. It looks so calculated. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. So, I don't see why your guardian's consent is a matter of great importance. Uh, oh, Frank, excuse me for interrupting you again, Lady Bracknell, but I think it only fair to tell you that according to her grandfather's will, she does not come of legal age till she is 35. <sighs> that, that does not seem to me to be a grave objection. 
35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have by their own free choice remained 35 for years. Uh, Lady Dumbleton is an instance in point. She has, to my own knowledge, remained 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which was many years ago now. So uh, I don't see why our dear Cecily wouldn't be even still more attractive at the age you mention now than she is at the present. Algy, could you wait for me until I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively, but I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I am not punctual myself, I know, but I do like punctuality in others, and waiting even to be married is quite out of the question. And what is to be done, Cecily? I do not know, Mr. Moncrief. Mr. Worthy, as Miss Cardew positively states she cannot wait until she is 35 to be married, a remark I am bound to say seems to show a rather impatient nature. I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. Oh, but Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. As soon as you consent to my marriage with Gwendolyn, I will gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my war. Uh, you must be quite aware that what you propose is out of the question. And a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can hope for. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Come, dear. We have already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christening, sir? Is not that somewhat premature? Uh, both of these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? The idea is grotesque and irreligious. Uh, Algernon, I forbid you to be baptized. I will not hear of such excesses. Uh, Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased to hear that this is the way in which you wasted your time and your money. Uh, am I to understand then that there are to be no baptisms at all this afternoon? Oh! I don't think as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. I'm grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savor of the heretical views, the Anabaptists, views which I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, seeing as your present mood is one that is particularly secular, I shall return to the church. In fact, I have been just informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. <laughs> Miss Prism? Did, did, I, did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Uh, pray, allow me to detain you for a moment, sir. Uh, this matter could prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect who is remotely connected to education? She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. <laughs> it is obviously the same person. May I ask, what position does she hold in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. <laughs> in spite of what I hear of her, I must meet her at once. Let her be sent for. Oh, uh, she approaches. She is not. <laughs> there you are, dear Canon. I was told you expected me in the vestry. I was waiting there for you for an hour and three quarters. Prison! Come here, Prism. Prism, where is that baby? Years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house, number 104, Upper Grosvenor Street, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned! A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was found standing alone at midnight in a remote corner of Bayswater. 
It contained a manuscript that had a, of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality, but the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Baby Bracknell, it is with great shame that I mean I do not know. I only wish I did. See, on the morning of the day that you mentioned, a day that is forever branded in my memory, I prepared as usual to take the baby out in its perambulator, and I had also with me that day a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I could never forgive myself, I deposited the baby into the bag and placed the manuscript in the bassinet. Oh. But where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Pritom, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited that handbag that contained that infant. I left it in one of the cloakrooms of the large railway station in London. What railway station? Victoria, the Brighton Line. Oh. I must retire to my room for a moment. Gwendolyn, you will wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait here for you all my life. What do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr. Chosable. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered a thing. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. <laughs> The noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as though we were having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They are always vulgar and often convincing. Oh, he appears to have stopped. I do wish he would arrive at some conclusion. This suspense is terrible. Miss Prism, is this the handbag? Now, examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It appears to be mine. Oh, oh here, here is the injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. <laughs> oh, here, oh, here, the, uh, the stain that was caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred in Leamington. Oh, here, on the lock, on my initials. <laughs> I'd forgotten an extravagant mood I'd had them place there. The bag is undoubtedly mine. I am so thrilled to have it returned to me. It was a great inconvenient thing without it all these years. <laughs> Miss Prism, more is restored to you than just this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes, mother. Oh, Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. Oh. Unmarried? I do not admit that that is a serious blow, but after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who suffers? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and another law for women? Mother, I forgive you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Worthing, there is some error. There is a lady who can tell you oh. who you really are. Lady Frackle, I don't mean to seem inquisitive, but could you kindly tell me who I am? I'm afraid the news I have to give you is not going to altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently Algernon's elder brother. <laughs> Algie's elder brother? <laughs> then I do have a brother after all. I always said I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have ever doubted that I had a brother? Come on. 
Dr. Chocobo, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. <laughs> Algy, you young scoundrel. You'll have to treat me with more respect in the future. You've never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not till today, old boy, I admit, but I was out of practice. <laughs> oh, my own. But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you've become someone else? Oh, good heavens, I'd quite forgotten that point. But I don't suppose the su your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change, except in my affections. What a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn! Well, then the matter must be cleared up at once. Uh, Aunt Augusta, a moment! When Miss Prison left me in that handbag, had I been christened, Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. That's good, then I had been christened. That settled. Then what name was I given? Let me know the worst. Being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. <clears throat> yes, but what was my father's Christian name? Your father's Christian name. Oh. Um. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh. Oh. I, I cannot at the present recall the general's Christian name, but I am sure he had one. He was an eccentric man, but uh, that was only in later years and mostly the result of the Indian climate and marriage and indigestion and things of that sort. Uh, Algy, can't you recollect our father's Christian name? Well, we were never on speaking terms, old boy. He died before I was a year old. Oh. Well, the, the army list of the, of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. Uh, yes, the general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. But I, I have no doubt that his name would appear in any military directory of the time. The, the army list of the last 40 years are here. Oh, these delightful records should have been my constant study. Ah, yes, yes, M, generals, um, um, Malum, Maxbum, Magli, what ghastly names they have. Oh. Markby, Mobs, Moncree, 1840, <gasps> Lieutenant, uh, Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General, 1869, Christian names, Ernest John. <laughs> 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 I always told you my name was Ernest Gwendolyn. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. <laughs> uh, yes, I do seem to recall the General's Christian name being Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the first that you could have no other name. Oh, Gwendolyn, it's a terrible thing for a man to learn that suddenly all his life he's been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you forgive me? I can, though I feel that you are sure to change. <laughs> my own one. Leticia. Oh, Frederick, at last. Leslie, oh, at last. Oh, Gwendolyn, at last. My nephew, you seem to be displaying signs of triviality. Oh, on the contrary, Aunt Augusta. I've now realized for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. <laughs>